Good afternoon. My name is Jeff Kwong, and I'm the interim director of the Center for Vaccine Preventable Diseases at the Dell Ellen School of Public Health. I'm pleased to welcome you to our webinar on COVID-19 vaccine safety surveillance in Canada. I want to start by apologizing for all of you who tried to log on last week uh, when our uh, webinar was originally scheduled. And unfortunately, we had technical difficulties with our Zoom account. And uh, so things had to be delayed to this week. So thank you all uh, for accommodating this change in our schedule. So um, before we begin with our webinar and I introduce the speakers, uh, I would like to start with the Indigenous land acknowledgement. I would first like to acknowledge um, the traditional territories of the Mississauga of the New Credit First Nation, Anishinaabe, Wendat, Huron, and Haudenosaunee uh, Indigenous peoples on which the Dalana School of Public Health now stands. The territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Ojibwe and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. We would also like to pay our respects to all our ancestors and to our present elders. So some housekeeping items, uh, we'd like to, we will try our best to address as many questions as possible. So please direct any questions um, you have to the um, panelists using the Q&A function. And if after the webinar, you can also use our email address, which is cvpd.dlsph at utoronto.ca. Okay, so now I'm gonna introduce our three uh, speakers. Uh, today, our three panelists are, first off, uh, we have uh, Dr. Sarah Wilson, who is a public health physician at Public Health Ontario, where she works closely with the multidisciplinary team responsible for provincial vaccine safety surveillance activities. She's a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons in Public Health and Preventive Medicine, an assistant professor at the Dalian School of Public Health and an adjunct scientist at ICS. Second, we have Dr. Julie Bettinger, who is an associate professor at the Vaccine Evaluation Center in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of British Columbia. She is an infectious disease epidemiologist whose research interests include vaccine safety and vaccine preventable diseases, specifically meningococcal and pneumococcal invasive infections, as well as attitudes and beliefs around immunization uptake and use. She is the data center a director for the Canadian Immunization Impact a Monitoring Program, ACTIVE, otherwise known as IMPACT, which is an active surveillance network for vaccine preventable diseases and vaccine adverse events in 12 tertiary care pediatric hospitals across Canada. And she's also the principal investigator for CERN's uh, Canadian National Vaccine Safety or CANVAS network, which monitors the safety of influenza vaccines each year and is monitoring the safety of COVID vaccines. And last but not least, we have Dr. Karina Topp, who is an associate professor in the Departments of Pediatrics and Community Health and Epidemiology at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Dr. Topp is the principal investigator of the Special Immunization Clinic Network within the CERN and also an investigator in uh, IMPACT as well. Her research focuses on vaccine safety surveillance, the clinical management of patients who have experienced adverse events following immunization, and vaccine safety and effectiveness in immunocompromised patients. So we're going to start off with a, a presentation by Sarah. Um, so we're going to pull up her slides. And here we go. Off we go, Sarah. Okay, thanks very much, Jeff. Thanks for the opportunity to be a part of this panel. So I'm going to provide a bit of a landscape view on vaccine safety and then spend most of my talk highlighting the role of PATS of vaccine safety surveillance. You can advance the slide, please. So I thought I'd first start just reminding everyone why vaccine safety is so important. And of course, we know that public confidence in vaccine safety is absolutely critical for our, the success of our programs. And I think really it's public confidence that is um, most highly linked with perceptions of vaccine safety. And so I think it's incredibly important for us to have systems in place to back up our claims as public health and immunization professionals about the safety of vaccines, to be able to address questions and be able to have systems in place to uh, proactively monitor and identify if there are any vaccine safety signals that require action. 
There is no doubt that there's a higher standard of safety that's expected of vaccines, and that's for good reason. We administer vaccines to large numbers of healthy people. For example, for the COVID vaccine program in Canada, more than a million people have been vaccinated to date. And the goal of vaccines, of course, is to prevent disease rather than as a treatment or a therapeutic intervention. And that also is very influential in terms of the risk benefit calculus. Can you move to the next slide, please? So vaccine safety starts even before vaccines are licensed. Um, and this continues across the vaccine life cycle, including once vaccines are incorporated into public programs. So as part of clinical trials, vaccine safety is assessed and um, the safety questions continue. For example, in large clinical trials that are looking at the safety of vaccines in thousands or tens of thousands of individuals that have the power to detect relatively common events. You can move to the next slide. So although that provides very valuable information to support vaccine decision-making and counseling, we know that the vaccine safety process needs to continue after licensure. Um, so this continues and the goals change slightly. So once vaccines are implemented in large scale programs and we're immunizing not tens of thousands, but hundreds of thousands and millions of individuals, we now have the numbers of vaccinated individuals to have the statistical power to identify um, rare or less common events that wouldn't have been detected in clinical trials. So that's certainly an important goal and aim of post-marketing surveillance. We also look to see if there's any increases in known events, so events that may have been detected in clinical trials, looking to see if these occur at an increased frequency. And then we also look to see if there's particular risk factors or conditions that might promote events or reactions. And then of course, our goal is to ensure that we have the capacity to identify any vaccine safety signals for a vaccine product or even at a lot level, at a specific vaccine lot level that would require further investigation and possible further action. You can advance the slide, please. So I've listed here some key pillars of vaccine uh, safety surveillance that act in complementary ways. So there is passive vaccine safety surveillance. So this is the reporting of adverse events following immunization to public health for further investigation, follow-up, and then collection as part of provincial and national surveillance systems. There's also active vaccine safety surveillance. So this involves the proactive collection of information either from vaccine recipients or proactively searching for specific events in clinical or administrative records. And then a final category would be what I've described here as special studies. There's a wide variety of what these might look like, but these could be in response to signal detection, or these could be studies that aim to collect additional information to better understand serious adverse events. So looking at risk factors, looking at risk of recurrence, et cetera. You can move to the next slide, please. So what is an adverse event following immunization? Well, the definition is very broad and that's very purposeful um, to allow us to be able to, to really have the power to detect unexpected events. So it's any untoward medical occurrence that follows immunization. It is linked in time with vaccines. So there's a temporal association, but not necessarily a causal relationship with vaccine. Can you move to the next slide, please? So this slide just lists some examples of uh, the types of adverse events that we collect in terms of surveillance systems, uh, both at, in terms of provincial uh, vaccine safety surveillance uh, classification. So just by way of example, we're looking for, uh, you know, injection site reactions of a certain um, intensity or duration, systemic reactions, of course, allergy, which has received a lot of attention with COVID-19 vaccines, and other events like neurologic events or other serious um, or unexpected events. Can we move to the next slide, please? So the objectives of passive vaccine safety surveillance are to identify and investigate serious and unexpected occurrence of adverse events, in particular for new vaccines, to detect and investigate safety signals um, of any variety, including any lot-specific problems, 
um, from a provincial perspective, we estimate provincial rates of adverse events by various classifications and by vaccine and by lot number and so forth. And then we also, um, I've stated here, one of our objectives of AP surveillance is to ensure that there's appropriate reporting. And this it looks, um, uh, this is sort of captured in a number of different realms. It includes the, the uh, passage of information from local, provincial, national, and international authorities, but it also includes public reporting through public dashboards and websites in the spirit of public transparency, which is to fulfill the final aim there in terms of maintaining public confidence in vaccine programs. If you can move to the next slide, please. So on that note of public transparency, I've just included a couple of screenshots here. This is a, a screenshot of our weekly epidemiologic summary for adverse events reported in Ontario. So we update this on a weekly basis and it's available on the Public Health Ontario website every day on Wednesdays. So that's just a screen, screenshot of last week's report. And then if you can advance the next slide, please. Um, and then this is an example of the dashboard from the Public Health Agency of Canada. The timelines are slightly different, but they also on a weekly basis um, are collating and sharing information with subsequent uh, text and further detail. This is just an example of what the dashboard looks like. So if you can move to the next slide, please. So I wanted just to um, highlight a number of different actors and the various roles and responsibilities. Passive vaccine safety surveillance in Canada and globally involves a number of different um, actors and stakeholders. So I just thought I'd walk you through this from the perspective of what happens in Ontario, uh, which is uh, very similar to what happens in other parts of Canada. So on the far left, you have adverse event case reports. So this is the completion of an adverse event following immunization case report form with details about the client, the reaction, and the immunization. And so this is uh, completed traditionally by healthcare providers, although uh, we also accept reports from vaccine clients themselves. And so this is reported to local public health units who then do appropriate follow-up and investigation, for example, collecting additional information to help guide the assessment, um, classification, and possibly uh, recommendations for re-immunization. And so that occurs at the level of local public health units who then pass this information along to the provincial level. So in Ontario, uh, that role is carried out by Public Health Ontario. So we review the AFI reports that are collected and um, documented within our provincial surveillance system and support public health units in their investigation and work closely with the Ministry of Health who provide policy direction for vaccine safety surveillance. So I mentioned earlier and provided an example of how we report on this at a, at a provincial level in Ontario, but this information is also shared uh, with the, at the national level. So our provincial, our Ontario provincial um, AFIs are then submitted to the Public Health Agency of Canada, who work very closely with, with Health Canada, who's the regulator. And I have some further details on this, this aspect of vaccine safety surveillance on the next slide. If you can advance the slide, please. So, um, so in terms of the roles and responsibilities here with the Public Health Agency of Canada and Health Canada, so the Public Health Agency of Canada receive adverse events following immunization reports from all provinces and territories, and those are entered and collected within the Canadian Adverse Event Following Immunization Surveillance System, or CAFIS. As I mentioned earlier, FAC also produces uh, public-facing summaries of this information. They also facilitate timely information sharing. So there's weekly calls uh, during flu season and now during COVID-19 vaccine program rollout to ensure that there's um, opportunities for the exchange um, of, of knowledge and awareness, situational awareness, for example, um, and um, around vaccine safety activities in Canada. And of course they work very closely with Health Canada who is the regulator in Canada. So Health Canada, they receive the reports that are submitted through CAFIS. They also have um, reports submitted through the Canada Vigilance Database. This includes individual and summary reports from manufacturers. And I think it's really important to highlight that under the Food and Drugs Act, that manufacturers have an obligation to very quickly report any serious events that they learn of to Health Canada. And of course, Health Canada is also connected with international regulators they have a role with causality assessment and can advise on any regulatory actions that might be needed if a vaccine safety signal were to be detected. 
can move to the next slide, please. And then the final thing I wanted just to highlight is that although I've spent quite a bit of time highlighting the details of passive vaccine safety surveillance at the provincial level, the roles and responsibilities at the national level, of course, this information is also fed up at, to international levels to advise on vaccine safety. And this is just a screenshot from the website of the uh, Global Advisory Committee on Vaccine Safety, who met on, uh, I believe it was on January 22nd, to review international reports that had been submitted describing deaths following COVID-19 vaccine in frail elderly, oftentimes um, uh, elderly individuals residing in long-term care facilities. And so this review was completed and they concluded that what has been observed to date is, is very much in line with the, what we would call background rates, sort of the expected baseline rate of, of, uh, of death in, in these very frail elderly individuals. So I just wanted to, to highlight here the, the role that the international vaccine community plays, which of course is drawn upon the strength of national, provincial and local systems. So I think that's it. I have um, our website here for the Vaccine Safety Program Area, Public Health Ontario, and would like to really say thanks to my colleagues at PHO who helped me with a number of these slides. So thank you. Great, thanks so much, Sarah, for that wonderful overview of, vac of safety surveillance. So now we'll move on to Julie uh, for your talk, please. I just need your slides up. Okay, great. Great, thanks. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I don't have any disclosures. Next slide, please. So today I'm going to describe the active vaccine safety surveillance systems that we have placed here in Canada. Dr. Wilson um, covered our overall safety surveillance system very, very ably, but I'm going to focus down in on the active components of these systems. And these are made up of two distinct uh, surveillance systems, IMPACT, the Immunization Monitoring Program Active, and CANVAS, the Canadian National Vaccine Safety Network. Next slide, please. So um, as Dr. Wilson mentioned, active surveillance really involves outreach to detect cases or to stimulate case reporting. It involves case searching of hospital records, laboratory reports, discharge summaries, all sorts of different administrative information sources can be used, as well as asking individuals themselves. Uh, clearly, if you're doing this type of outreach to find cases, it's going to be more resource intensive than our passive surveillance system. And so oftentimes it's done in, in a form called sentinel surveillance, where you actually focus in on what you hope are representative areas of the population and you monitor really closely in those representative areas. And you're wanting to ensure that the population that you're looking at will represent the entire group so that it's, it can then be scaled up to sort of represent the whole population. Next slide, please. So the Immunization Monitoring Program Active, or IMPACT, is a sentinel surveillance system uh, that was established in 1991 as a result, actually, of a um, vaccine safety signal. And it covers over 90% of our tertiary care pediatric beds and receives referrals from all provinces and territories and represents approximately 50% of the pediatric population. Next slide, please. So the targets that are included in impact for our adverse event following immunization surveillance are seizures, and we capture both febrile and non-febrile seizures, encephalopathy and encephalitis, and ADEM, which are, is another neurologic condition, myelitis, Guillain-Barre syndrome, or GBS, and other acute flaccid paralyses, thrombocytopenia, intussusception, and then we have sort of an other or miscellaneous category. And so anything that's coming in uh, that doesn't quite fit any of the above categories, but is serious enough to result in hospitalization can go into this category. And what happens is we've got our nurse monitors at each of the centers at, who are paid to actually look for all of these cases. So they will be searching both um, emergency department sheets as well as admission sheets to try to find cases that fit these categories. When they're identified, they then will go look for the immunization history to see if the individual was immunized prior to the admission. Next slide, please. So the other surveillance system that I wanted to touch on is Canvas, and this is really participant-centered surveillance. It's active as well, and it was set up to monitor the safety of our influenza vaccines each fall, um, and in the event of an, what we were thinking, an influenza pandemic, to monitor the safety of our influenza um, 
pandemic vaccines, but uh, it has actually pivoted uh, to monitor COVID vaccines and is involved with monitoring the safety of our COVID rollout. Um, so what it's doing for COVID is we're planning to enroll 50,000 participants per vaccine product per province or territory that are participating in the surveillance. Uh, and what's unique about this surveillance is that it actually includes a control group. So unlike some of our other systems where we're only capturing uh, cases that are occurring in people who've been vaccinated, we also capture events in people who haven't been vaccinated as part of Canvas. And this really enables us to detect signals. So we can see what is happening in our background rate, the people who haven't been vaccinated, and we can see if we see a higher rate in our group who have been vaccinated. And this is a real strength, I think, of Canvas because it enables the detections of signals much more quickly and oftentimes with a greater precision than what we might get from other, some of our other systems. And it's a real complement to what we already have in place. Um, I've included the website here in case you're interested. Uh, we are enrolling individuals who have been vaccinated and we will start enrollment of our control group uh, probably this week or next week. So if you'd like to participate as a control, uh, please check back on the website in a couple of weeks and sign up. Next slide, please. So the way Canvas is working is that we are sending out an online survey eight days after someone receives their first dose of vaccine and then eight days after the second dose. And that um, dose two vaccine survey will cover the time period between the first survey and the next survey. So we're capturing that interval in between the two doses. And then we'll send a third survey six months after the last vaccination to sort of have a longer follow-up time period. Anyone who reports a medically attended event, we do follow up by telephone and we try to keep this follow-up within about 72 hours after the event has been reported. Any events that we identify that are provincially reportable, meaning that they should go into the passive surveillance system that Dr. Wilson described, we then refer on to that system. So in a sense, we're eliciting more events for our passive surveillance system, but also screening out some of the noise because we do detect things that aren't reportable. It's still interesting to know, for example, how many people have an injection site reaction. It gives us a sense of how reactogenetic our vaccines are, but those not, aren't necessarily always provincially reportable. Next slide, please. So again, this is just a shot from our website and I'm just gonna put it out there one more time. It really does rely on people actively participating in this. This is self-reported from our participants and we've tried to make it quite easy for people to go on ahead and sign up. Next slide, please. Thanks. And I'm happy to take questions about it at the end. Great, thanks so much, Julie. Now moving on to Karina to wrap things up for us. Great, thanks. Uh, so I'm going to speak about, you know, what happens next once we've de detected an adverse event full immunization through either those the active syst surveillance system or the passive surveillance system. What are the next steps for the patients involved um, and uh, how do we evaluate safety signals. Next slide please. So those are my disclosures. Uh, next slide. So when patients um, have had uh, symptoms of an adverse event following immunization, um, that um, it's been shown that they may have heightened concerns about vaccine safety uh, around future vaccinations. And in, um, when these events are severe enough to come to medical attention, the healthcare providers may be uncertain about the risk of a recurrent adverse event occurring if the future doses of the same vaccine are needed. Um, and, um, and may uncer be uncertain about how best to proceed. And unaddressed concerns around um, how to manage patients with adverse events following immunization could contribute to delay or avoidance of vaccinations that can leave them, leave them um, vulnerable to vaccine preventable disease. Next slide. So we established the Special Immunization Clinic Network, which is a network within CERN, um, in 2013 to standardize and improve the clinical care of patients with previous adverse events following immunization, um, to estimate the rate of recurrence of different types of adverse events following revaccination with the same vaccine associated with the initial adverse event, and to build a research platform for uh, clinical vaccine safety studies. And so we started at 12 centers, mostly based in pediatric tertiary care hospitals, um, working with um, infectious disease specialists and allergists, and now with additional um, funding uh, from CIHR and the Public Health Agency, um, 
we are expanding our capacity to see adults um, with adverse events following COVID vaccination across the Canada. So there, um, the map there shows this uh, cities where we currently have SAC sites and those in bold are, are um, sites where we're seeing, uh, able to see both adults and children. Next slide, please. So uh, the special immunization clinics are really embedded within routine clinical care. And so um, when an adverse event is reported to public health or patients present to their primary care provider, um, those um, healthcare health professionals can refer patients directly to the special immunization clinic. And there they undergo a standardized assessment of the adverse event or the underlying um, adverse event following immunization, or if they have um, specific underlying conditions like immunocompromised that are complicating vaccination, we see those patients as well. And then um, recommendations around uh, further vaccinations are made based on a risk benefit analysis and uh, network protocols that um, help guide um, physician decision making, um, as but are also an individual decision ultimately up to the physician and, and the patient. Um, if patients are recommended for further vaccinations, then uh, we try to vaccinate them in our clinic where possible. Um, and then all patients are followed up post-vaccination to uh, determine if they experienced any adverse events and as well to capture details of vaccinations that were given outside of the SIC, such as um, if they were re-vaccinated by public health, for example. And then um, we also have research embedded within the special immunization clinic so that uh, patients who meet certain inclusion criteria are invited to uh, consent to have their clinical data without um, any identifying information entered into our national database for analysis of the national experience in these clinics. Uh, next slide, please. So um, in terms of the adverse events that are of particular interest or concern um, related to COVID vaccines, um, we're prioritizing patients who've had immediate hypersensitivity or anaphylaxis after COVID-19 vaccination. Um, patients who have uh, suspected hypersensitivity to a vaccine component, such as uh, polyethylene glycol or PEG that's found in the um, mRNA vaccines, can be seen um, for a pre-vaccination assessment. And then we're also uh, capturing patients who have um, unexpected, severe, or serious um, systemic adverse events that prevent daily activities or require medical attention, particularly after the first dose where they need future, further doses. And um, there's a range of adverse events of special interest, some of which um, Dr. Wilson mentioned in her presentation that we um, are also uh, accepting referrals for. So things like neurological symptoms or um, people who may have uh, very severe COVID um, after completing a vaccination series. Uh, next slide, please. So to um, facilitate rapid referrals into the clinic in order to ensure that patients can complete their vaccination series without too much delay, we're um, collaborating with Canvas, uh, the Canvas COVID study to um, uh, facilitate referrals of patients who have medical uh, adverse events identified through that system that may meet our criteria for evaluation. We've been working with public health to expand uh, rapid referral processes and uh, adapted our protocol for adverse events of particular concern with COVID vaccines, including developing a clinical um, protocol that's underway for managing patients who have suspected anaphylaxis after COVID vaccination. And then finally, we're um, developing a study to evaluate safety and immunogenicity of COVID vaccines um, in immunocompromised populations, not that were excluded from the clinical trials to help guide evidence around the best way to vaccinate those groups of patients. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so just uh, the last couple minutes, I wanted to touch on the CERN Provincial Collaborative Network. So this is a network that, um, among other things, is involved in post-market evaluation of COVID vaccine safety. Um, it's run, um, co-led by uh, Dr. Pong, as well as uh, Dr. Shannon McDonald at uh, University of Alberta. And P uh, the Provincial Collaborative Network um, uses existing um, laboratory immunization and health administrative databases that are linkable at the individual level to conduct uh, public health relevant research and evaluation. And with COVID vaccines, um, 
the network is uh, assessing associations between health outcomes and COVID vaccination across um, at least five provinces representing 90% of the Canadian population. And they uh, are looking at safety overall, as well as in population subgroups, such as uh, women who are pregnant, um, uh, frail elderly individuals, um, and those with underlying medical conditions. And then they'll also be testing for association between specific adverse events, following immunization of interest and vaccination. And the model that they use, um, where it's called the Provincial Collaborative Network, is that each province that's involved conducts um, the data analysis in parallel using the same methods and then the estimates are combined in a meta-analysis. And that's really because we don't have um, that level of data available in, in national databases. Uh, next slide, please. So in, in short, um, the SIC network is um, helping to support public health and managing patients with adverse events following immunization and engaging in um, investigating uh, suspected um, vaccine safety signals, such as allergic events after uh, COVID vaccines. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the sec um, we also are evaluating, or CERN is also evaluating vaccine safety through uh, existing health databases. Um, next slide. So that just um, wanted to acknowledge all our, our large and growing SIC investigator team. And next slide. And um, your best contact if you have, if you're looking for how to refer to the SIC would be to reach out to our project manager, Melissa Holmes and her email address is there. So thank you and I'm happy to take questions. Great, thank you so much for that, Karina. So now we're gonna move on to the uh, Q&A part. And uh, what we have is we have some uh, questions prepared uh, that we'll start with. So in December, the government of Canada announced that it will be introducing a Pan-Canadian No-Fault Vaccine Injury Support Program, or VISP. Can one of you uh, provide an update on this program? Perhaps Sarah, start. Sure, I'll, tr I'll try to take that, sure. So I think, um, so as you say, in, in early December, there was an announcement that Canada would be creating that program called this Vaccine Injury Support Program. Um, I think there hasn't been a lot of additional detail provided so far. I think what I've learned through some of the groups that I participate in is that uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada is um, planning the launch of that program. It will be modeled on the program that exists in Quebec. So Quebec is currently the only province um, in Canada that has an existing vaccine injury compensation program. And so they'll be looking closely at Quebec's model. And, uh, and that also involves um, um, a causality assessment process. And so that will be also incorporated in terms of the, the national program. So I think there'll be more details to come um, as, uh, as the process moves forward. But I think it is, um, I think really uh, an important development that brings Canada in line with other G7 countries in terms of having a vaccine injury compensation program. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, Okay, next question is, um, how will safety in pregnancy and in immunocompromised patients be monitored? And I think all of you um, alluded to some of this in each of your uh, talks. I don't know if you want to go in turn to, to speak to this. Um, perhaps, uh, Julie, do you want to speak to what Tam is sure. doing for this? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to sort of take a uh, first stab at this. So as part of Canvas, we're actually collecting specific information on whether or not either in our control or our vaccinated group, someone is pregnant or breastfeeding, um, as well as if they ha are immunocompromised or have an autoimmune condition. Uh, so, yeah, you know, it's hard to say whether we'll have enough respondents to be able to look at this in a subgroup analysis, but our plan is actually then to do, you know, separate analyses of these groups to see if we see anything different from the overall population. Mm -hmm. And Karina, do you want to take a stab at uh, what SICK will be doing or you can? Talk? Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned, we are um, preparing a, a proposal to look at the safety and immune response to COVID vaccines in a specific um, immunocompromised population. We've also been approached, um, there's a lot of interest by uh, research networks and 
patient groups that represent uh, patients with a range of types of immunocompromising conditions, such as transplant, um, cancer, um, and uh, autoimmune disease. And so we've um, been collaborating with them and sort of, I guess, collaborate, we're looking to collaborate with them on uh, evaluating safety and, and um, in those populations as well. So um, as well as understanding, you know, how well do different groups respond to the vaccine? Because that also affects, you know, how we view the risks and benefits of vaccination. Great, thanks. Um, and yeah, and so obviously a yeah, provincial collaborative network will be also looking at this as well in, you know, using population-based data in, in the various populations, in the various provinces, I mean. Oh, and, you know, this ties in nicely with one of the questions from our audience, you know, uh, and this goes to Sarah, you know, when sharing information with the public, are only the number of AEs adverse events and type of adverse events provided, or is there any specific information on um, any underlying comorbidities that could have led to the adverse event? So I think this is like tied into this question. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to, um, answer that question. Sarah. Sure. Well, I think the the short answer is that it really depends. So I would say that in, you know, when we're looking at our sort of summary tables, looking at events, we don't, I think it's fair to say, um, are we still on? Okay. On the other hand, when we're describing serious events in a sort of descriptive way, we often will describe um, particular risk factors and try to balance providing information about a particular event um, or a classification of serious events um, while trying to respect privacy. So I think it is very nuanced. Um, and we have in the past with some of our reporting um, ha have provided some, some specific examples, but I think the, the question highlights the fact that for sort of robust kind of rates by specific uh, population groups that I think that there are some other complementary approaches like the ones that you've mentioned with perinatal registries or administrative data or clinical data sets that can really help augment passive vaccine safety surveillance for those special populations. Great, thanks so much. Okay, another question. This one is gonna be for Julie. Um, the vSafe mobile app used by the CDC in the US for active vaccine safety surveillance has received um, you know, some recent attention. How is vSafe similar or different from Canvas? Great, that's a great question, thanks. So I think um, they're both partici participant-centered surveillance systems, meaning we're asking people who have been vaccinated to participate and tell us about their experience. The difference I think with vSafe is uh, it does not include a control group. So as with all of our other types of surveillance, it's only capturing events that are happening in individuals who've been vaccinated, which is still great, but it can be quite difficult in participant-centered surveillance to really tease out then when you see a signal because you do end up collecting a lot of um, extra stuff. You could call it noise, but but I actually think it's quite interesting, but it's, it's not always relevant to what you really want to look at. And so it's really helpful to have that control group to see when a specific event is peaking higher in your vaccinated group. And if you don't have that control group, it can be really challenging to make sense of the data that you're getting in there. But, it, but it's still, it's still, I think, uh, you know, in, in countries that that's what they've set up and that's what they have, it will still provide information. You'll just have to be a bit more cautious on how you're interpreting the information coming in. Thanks, Julie. Okay, um, here's a question uh, from Ross Upshur. Um, and I think this is uh, directed towards Sarah for sure and possibly for all three of our panelists. Um, so the question is, how does information gathered in surveillance get flowed back to the broader community? i.e. practitioners, policymakers, and the general public. Um, who wants to give this a first crack? I can try to give it a first go. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that's an excellent question. And I think also part of why I wanted to highlight some of the existing sort of dashboards or products that have been developed so far. So I think that, um, 
I think this this question is key because I think it does highlight the fact, I think as Ross, uh, as a public health physician knows, surveillance is meant to be a continuous circle with a feedback loop. It's not just sort of popping something out at some, some sort of end of a linear line. So it is important that we feed this information back. And I would say the, you know, the ways that we do that are, are um, I'll just sort of articulate those very briefly. Certainly from an Ontario context, I can just say that we are routinely communicating with uh, our ministry counterparts who are responsible for policy. So we share detailed up the, the detailed information on a weekly basis and, um, you know, answer any sort of specific follow-up questions that might follow um, the sharing of that information. Um, there's the public reporting that I described, which I understand is uh, I think is fair. You could sort of critique it as being maybe not so digestible for a public audience. And that's partly related to our role at Public Health Ontario in terms of supporting public health units and health system stakeholders. But that being said, traditionally with our other vaccine safety products, we have um, generally every year with our vaccine safety report also generated infographics, sort of one or two page summaries with very descriptive tables, pointing out sort of the key highlights that we have available on our website and then also have um, partnered with the ministry in terms of sharing those sort of more infographic summaries with public health units when they go out to visit community-based practices as part of vaccine storage and handling. Because part of that piece is not just sharing the information back, but it's also around encouraging providers to report. I think that's so essential in terms of the strength of our passive vaccine safety surveillance. It, it really is, I mean, we talked about the ways that, that things like Canvas, for example, can augment passive vaccine safety surveillance, but the, the bread and butter of vaccine, passive vaccine safety surveillance is requiring healthcare providers to report those adverse events in. So I think it is really important to feed that information back because we want to encourage clinicians to report those informations and report those uh, events and, and know how to do it. So, so those are just some examples. And I think, you know, we do try to tailor the materials and I think um, we'll be continuing to co contemplate sort of how, how to keep doing a better job of that during COVID when you know, I, th I think it's relatively unprecedented, at least for Public Health Ontario, to be generating this information in a publicly um, available form on a weekly basis so that, you know, there is quite a bit of machinery that takes place to do that to ensure good data quality and appropriate representation. So I think that piece about how to get it out beyond our website is certainly something we're discussing further. So I'll leave it there for now. Yeah, thank you. That's great. And maybe we can piggyback for reporting back on active surveillance and, uh, you know, special mm -hmm. studies as well, yeah. Yeah, using the yeah. same mechanisms um, in each province. Now, here's a question from Monica Dutt uh, directed to Karina. Um, you know, can provinces without an SIC, um, that's special immunization clinic, access the expertise? So an out of province referral. So Monica is a public health in public health uh, in New Newfoundland and Labrador. And uh, her understanding is that they don't have access to SIC. Um, Karina, do you wanna answer that question? Yeah, happy to. So yeah, thanks for that question. I, I, I think um, it's, you know, it's been a limitation of our network that we've been, we have been uh, focused in tertiary care centers and in the major centers across Canada. And so there's huge mm -hmm. swaths of the country that are not well covered by this special immunization clinic. Um, and certainly we do, all those centers have access to, um, or have um, established good two-way communication with public health so that uh, we do get quite a few questions um, from public health here in Nova Scotia and to our site in Halifax, just with questions and, and helping and, you know, requesting help with whether to refer patients or not. And now with increased virtual care, um, doing virtual consults is um, more feasible and easier to do. So I think um, where you're in Newfoundland, um, you know, you know, you could certainly direct a, uh, a referral to us in Halifax and, and we can see if there would be a way to, to do a virtual consult. Um, we are also uh, um, applying for additional funding so that we can further expand the network beyond the current sites and to try to get a, a truly, establish a truly national network so that we have coverage at least um, in all provinces and, and at least some links with territories. Great, thanks. 
Okay, so now we have a question about, uh, for this is from Dr. Paula Maselli and building on a question from uh, Leo Frank Avon on uh, whether we'll be, um, you know, looking at passive and active safety surveillance considering the interval uh, between dose one and dose two as a potential variable of investigation. So if some people are getting their second dose delayed by, you know, some number of weeks and does, will that have an impact uh, you know, both on not effectiveness, which is not the focus on to, of today's talk, but also uh, on safety surveillance. I don't know if anyone wants to. Um... Oh, Jeff, I'll take that one, at least speaking, um, I, I'll speak to both from impacts point of view, as well as um, Canvas. And so impact is primarily focused on pediatric, well, it is focused on pediatric adverse events. So, um, but we're anticipating that we'll have COVID vaccines in the pediatric population, hopefully within the next year. And in terms of the interval, that's less relevant because we would collect it for whatever event is coming in based on the admission date. And we would look back and see when they got vaccinated, um, taking the interval into account, but it would be reportable either way. Canvas is a little bit trickier um, because when we initially set it up, you know, we were anticipating a bit more standardized, um, maybe a standardized rollout around the second dose. And so it has been somewhat challenging to kind of uh, work with this with all of the moving parts. And, and so what we're gonna have to do really is look at it in the analysis um, because it, 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 otherwise it's just, there's no other way to kind of account for the, you know, the 12 week interval in Quebec and the 21 day interval in Alberta and the 28 interval in some places and some places are using 42 days and in BC we've got 35 days. So um, we're just going to collect it all and we're going to try to sort it out in the analysis. Not the best, not, not how we wanted to do it, but um, I think oftentimes with observational studies, that's what ends up happening. And, you know, we are collecting quite large sample sizes for all of the products. So we should have enough data coming in to really be able to look at this once, it, once, once we really start moving with the vaccine program. Thanks. Great, thank you. And just a quick follow-up question for you, Julie, is, um, you know, why are not all provinces included in Canvas? Uh, uh, that's a great question. So we are working on expanding, as Karina said. Um, it is limited to funding and also uh, limited to having active partners in public health who are willing to sort of work with us on the project. Um, so we're, we're in conversations with some of our other um, provinces and territories uh, to see if they have capacity and interest in joining us and trying to figure out how we can best support them. Um, and the hope was to sort of have it all across Canada. I don't know if we're gonna quite achieve that, but we're certainly open to that. Great, thank you. Okay, now we're gonna switch gears to a question from Keith King. How is indigenous data governments attended to in these studies? Are there opportunities for indigenous, indigenous nations to get nation specific data on AFIs? This is a great question. I don't know if anyone has any answer to that. Well, I'll, I'll speak, I can speak for impact and um, Canvas. So for Canvas, we don't collect that, we, we actually don't collect a lot of uh, demographic information. The idea is to really keep barriers low for people participating. So we wouldn't actually be able to identify who's indigenous and who's not in our data. We don't ask that question. Um, certainly we could partner with indigenous nations if they were interested in doing this, but that would be a, a different conversation and, and probably looks slightly different than how we've set up the, the main system, but uh, it's quite flexible. And so that possibility would exist. I think the real limitation is it does rely on um, the internet and it's an online survey. And I think even, you know, we're finding even in some of the territories, um, you know, internet access is not as widespread as I think people think it is when you start to get to more remote and rural regions. So that would have to sort of be part of the conversation, I think. Um, for impact, we do try to capture ethnicity, uh, but we are abstracting information from the hospital chart, and this is not reliably captured in hospital charts. So if the information's there, we, we abstract it as part of our information, but uh, most times it's not. So we aren't, unfortunately aren't really able to look at that with impact either. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Sarah, Julie, do you guys wanna have any, um, do you have any response to this question or, or take a pass? Well, sure, I, Sarah here, I can try to answer. I mean, I can say that um, in Ontario, we don't have any indigenous identifiers or, or identifiers in relation to um, race or ethnicity within the system that collects information on adverse events following immunization. So 
um, that's the that's the scenario in Ontario, although that might not be the case elsewhere. I think that the, that may um, I think you know the particularities of all the different data elements that would go along with the collect, uh, the reporting of an adverse event. Uh, that there are some differences across provinces and territories. So I wouldn't just want to be clear that I'm describing the scenario in Ontario. So um, I'm not sure what it's like in other parts of Canada. Um, and I guess the other point that I'll just make is that I, I know that there is interest in um, anyways I think the the topic more broader than um, indigenous um, um, collect, information collection I think in terms of race and ethnicity and other other information I know there's a lot of active discussion right now in terms of immunization and I think it's it will be interesting to see how that progresses beyond just program delivery and also um, see how that unfolds in terms of um, adverse events following immunization. Um, and maybe I can just uh, speak briefly to, I mean, in terms of the special immunization clinic network, we're really doing individual patient assessments. So we haven't actually to date captured um, Indigenous status or ethnicity, um, but I think, you know, um, going forward as we're, especially with the assessing COVID vaccines and already differences that we've seen by um, race, ethnicity, and in terms of uh, severity of COVID disease, I think that will be important to do going forward. Um, I also can say it's sort of on national uh, committees that I'm on, there's certainly been a lot of discussion about how we can uh, conduct and augment sur vaccine safety surveillance um, in, uh, in Indigenous or with Indigenous uh, communities. And I think, um, you know, if there are communities that are interested in engaging with us or um, in sort of addressing questions around vaccine safety in their communities, then we'd certainly be, there's certainly openness and willingness to work together. I think it's just, um, we've just been challenged in trying to find, um, you know, communities that are uh, just, I guess, putting the, the pieces together, find, pairing the communities and, and the researchers. Great. Great. So now we have two questions um, related to terminology that I thought were kind of re were related. And I'm going to read both of them, and then we can have a bit of discussion about them. So the first question is uh, from Sabina Vora Mira, uh, Miller. Um, you know, is there any consideration on changing the terminology or name of the vaccine injury compensation program? Because it fuels a lot of anti-vaccine discourse. And the second question uh, from Paula Maselli again, you know, with regard to vaccine hesitancy, the framing of adverse event reporting seems to be important. For example, certain adverse events are unexpected, whereas other adverse events uh, reveal the immunization process to be unfolding, such as sore arm, fever, etc. So in what ways is this issue given consideration in the preparation of reports and sharing of info with the public? I think both of these are kind of uh, important issues on like, you know, how we frame things, you know, um, that we're expecting to see. And, you know, I don't know if any of you have any comments, uh, you know, in response to these questions. Well, can I just quickly respond? I think in terms of the, um, the first question about the vaccine injury, um, program. Um, my understanding, and again, this is this is just from the press release that was issued in December, um, is that the terminology that um, was released as at that time was that it would be described as a vaccine injury support program. So, so I take that to be probably in response, proactive response to the comments that uh, that um, our colleague has put into the chat, po chat box. So, um, so anyways, I, I, I just wanted to highlight that, that it, there does seem to be quite a deliberate move away from the word compensation. And I think the, the um, person who's written the comment in the chat box, I think that's quite insightful in terms of some of the charged language around compensation, especially in, a, in the setting of, um, a, you know, a voluntary immunization program. Um, and then the second piece was around the framing. And I guess I'll just say that um, I think that's really an excellent comment. And I think something that 
um, I'll just speak from the perspective of Public Health Ontario in terms of some of the conversations we've had as we've prepared the, the epi summary that I've been describing. And I think it is, it is challenging and I think a real balance, I think for us in public health wanting to ensure that there is transparency, that we're sharing you know, what we're receiving in terms of our, provincial, our provincial surveillance data. Um, so, so, you know, wanting to meet the aim and objective of transparency, but also providing some contextual detail around especially serious events. Um, you know, we certainly highlight, you know, for example, a case, you know, if something uh, just as, as by, by way of example, you know, a serious event that it's been resolved at the time of follow up or contextualizing it in terms of um, other clinical information, again, with the balance of not uh, you know, not overstepping any privacy concerns, but but I do think it is, it is challenging. Um, I think, as I mentioned earlier in the sort of uh, the talk that I gave, it's, you know, it's about um, the perception of vaccine safety, um, and I think the risk communication around adverse events is is quite challenging because of the temporal association. It's not always a causal association. Um, there's, you know, what is the background rate of different events? And so I think there is a lot to unpack when we're presenting this information. And I think it does need a lot of contextualization, which, you know, takes a lot of time and, and, and being quite thoughtful. But I appreciate the, the comment because I think that is really what it's all about in terms of trying to communicate um, some of the basic principles of, you know, is this unexpected, is this expected? And, um, and try to answer those while still providing, you know, digestible information. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Anyone else want to um, address those uh, comments and questions? Sure, maybe I'll just jump in. I think um, that I may not have been entirely consistent in my talk today, but I try to be very conscious of referring to, rather than using adverse events or adverse events following immunization, particularly with Canvas, I try to call them health events because we're, we have people who've been vaccinated and people who haven't. So um, it's not entirely accurate to call them an adverse event. And I do better, I think, probably when I write about it than when I speak about it. Um, but I do think that there is some room to describe even the expected events, because if people are expecting to have a sore arm and pain, and in fact, that they may even, um, you know, run a fever and not feel like going to work the next day after they get vaccinated, it makes it a little bit less scary than if they're not told to expect that and it happens. And I think one of it, we, we've even um, got a publication where we were looking at um, the influenza vaccines and we showed that headaches were more likely to occur among vaccinated participants than non-vaccinated participants. So that would be a signal. Um, you know, it doesn't say the vaccine caused the headache, but it's certainly higher in a vaccinated group. And so if you can tell people you may have a headache after you get your flu shot, you know, it's okay to take some Tylenol. Um, you know, that's, that I think lessens the concern and the worry and the fear around um, potential events after vaccination and also then enables people to better determine when something really is unusual and they should seek medical care. Thanks, Julie. Karina, do you want to add anything or? Yeah, just so with the special immunization clinic, as I, we're counseling individual patients around, um, you know, what to expect when they're revaccinated and what the risks are of, um, as well as trying to counsel them around what we think the likelihood was that the vaccine caused the adverse event in the first place. And so those are very individual decisions, but I think, you know, the general principles that Julia outlined are, are what we use. And, and I think the point about, you know, for people who have, say, have had, you know, big, large local reactions, so their entire upper arm swells up after getting their flu shot every year, you know, it, I think it's helpful to reassure them that, uh, to let them know that, yeah, there's a you know chance that that could happen again, probably about one in three chance, but it's not likely to be more severe. And so that's sort of been some of the work that we've done is to really understand what's the chance that these events are gonna recur and how likely is it to have a more severe event? Cause that's, I think what people are more concerned about is it gonna be worse the next time? Uh, so that's been our approach. Great. Well, unfortunately we're running out of time and uh, there are some more questions I can see, but we will try to get to these um, after we'll try to uh, prepare some responses to these remaining questions and feel free to send any further questions you have to our email address and we will do our best to try to respond to them. This uh, webinar has been recorded 
And so will be available, will be posted on the CVPD website um, at some uh, shortly after, uh, after today. But I just wanted to thank our three uh, panelists, um, you know, Sarah Wilson, uh, Julie Bettinger, and Karina Topp, as well as um, our, the behind the scenes, we have uh, Shaza Fadal um, and Liz uh, Loftus, who have done a phenomenal job organizing all of this. I wanna thank all of you uh, for participating today. And uh, we look forward to at our next, uh, having you uh, join us for our next webinar uh, in April. Thank you very much and have a great day. Stay safe, everybody. Bye now. <laughs>